Welcome, everybody, to Robert H. Jackson Birthday Celebration. He would be 127 years old today and born just down the road in Spring Creek Township, Warren County, Pennsylvania. And Professor John Barrett, the Robert Jackson biographer, noted his birthday. And for those who are not on John Barrett's blog, which comes out and he talks about Warren County's own Robert H. Jackson, see me and I will make sure that you get on that email list because it's terrific. And a few years ago, he penned this birthday. And Robert H. Jackson was born on the Jackson family farm near Spring Creek in Warren County, Pennsylvania. A little biography. He descended from early United States settlers. In 1797, Jackson's great-grandfather, Elijah Jackson, built the very first white settlement in Spring Creek Township. In 1829, Elijah's and Mary Watt Jackson's son, Robert Rutherford Jackson, was born there. In 1862, Roberts and Mary Eldred Jackson's son, William Eldred Jackson, was born there. And on February 13, 1892, Will Jackson and Angelina Howitt Jackson's son, Robert Howitt Jackson, was born there in the same house, in the same room, where his father had been born in Spring Creek Township. We actually have family members here. Lisa, Lisa Miller, Lisa? There we are. Thank you and welcome. She's from the Howitt side, from Russell, Pennsylvania, and we welcome you tonight. And before I introduce our guest and give a little bit of background, I want to give a plug. I want to give a plug because a few years ago, at the encouragement of a couple of members here, we actually spent some time at Spring Creek finding and clearing the area which is Robert Jackson's homestead. So the actual uh, stones for the foundation stones are all there nicely laid out. The barn is all there nicely laid out. We prevailed upon the good folks at Mercyhurst University who uh, did an archaeological dig and find and research, and they're going to present it all at Spring Creek Township Fire Hall May 11th. May 11th, Saturday, May 11th, and my good friend Josh Cotton right over here from the Warren Observer will alert you to that. Thank you, Josh. I think he agreed to do that. So, and that'll all happen May 11th, so come one, come all, and it's an opportunity. Norm Carlson, who runs our Fenton History Center, and Norm will be there also. Thank you, Norm. I knew you'd be interested. So that's a plug for May 11th. This event started when Sam Bonavita, an attorney from Warren, asked me to come down and talk about Justice Jackson. Asked, and I don't know if I even introduced myself for those who don't know. I'm Greg Peterson, one of the co-founders of the Jackson Center. In 2005, came down and gave a couple of speeches on the anniversary of the Nuremberg trial and did that for a couple of years. And then we settled in on this day, this special day, Robert Jackson's birthday, which makes Warren County really lay claim, can lay absolute claim to the legacy of Justice Jackson. And we've had such speakers as Henry King, a Nuremberg prosecutor, Judge Sutton, Ken Gormley, Chief Justice John Saylor, David Crane, the Chief Prosecutor of the International Tribunal at Sierra Leone, Jim Johnson, his deputy, Ben Snyder, uh, his parents are here, Ben uh, from Warren, who clerked for Justice Roberts. That's a huge deal, folks. Uh, Justice John Cleland spoke here about the Sandusky case. Warren native Tim Gay spoke. We talked about the Cobham Castle here with uh, Bob Metzger and Kathy Lang. And last year, we actually went to another location. We had Robert Jackson actually here. Uh, and I know, I know, you're thinking this is mystic. That's all true. But we had uh, Robert Jackson in the form of an actor who wonderfully came back to Warren to discuss that. So we're thrilled 
to have with us today, Justice Max Bayer. And he's a justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Big deal, big deal. And I th want to thank, you know, Justice Judge Skirda and Judge for, for making this a reality. I don't know uh, this if we we had enough, I don't think we had enough pull to get him here without your in involvement. So he can talk to that. And I want to thank also Judge Hammett for making this wonderful, this great looking courtroom available for the Robert H. Jackson event. And as I was mentioning, Justice Max Baer elected to the Supreme Court 2003. Prior to that, he was in the Court of Common Pleas at Allegheny County from 1990 to 2003. And during that time period, he implemented far-reaching reforms in the Juvenile Court and Domestic Relations Court. He spoke at Chautauqua last year. He was on the dais there and spoke about gerrymandering with Duquesne Law School Dean uh, Lolly Green. And tonight, he's going to try, he will not try, I'm sure he'll succeed. I shouldn't be, it should never be, oh my gosh, far be it for me. But his topic he's taken on is from, from William Penn, Pennsylvania, in the beginning, to John Marshall, to Robert H. Jackson. I can't wait to figure out how he ties this all together. Ladies and gentlemen, Justice Max Baer. Thank you, I appreciate it. Now, where did my book go? You have my book. Oh, yeah. Would you well, like I've to deliver this? I've done a couple of times. You know, you, you didn't memorize it? Probably I do, but uh, this is probably better. Before I begin, and it's wonderful to be here, for all the young students at Kong Law at um, uh, Allegheny College. We were talking earlier about gerrymandering and why it's the legislature. It's uh, Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1 of the uh, Federal Constitution. It's the Time, Place, and Manner Clause. And it says, the time, place, manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed by each state by the legislature thereof. And therefore, it falls to the legislature. Uh, and, and, and I don't want to digress too much, but when you ride from state to state or you're vacationing in a different state and they have their primaries in a different month or on a different day or their general election where they have all sorts of different rules, it's because of that clause. It says it's up to the states and it's not the federal government's prerogative to control all that. So that's why, with the exception of the, um, the, the federal elections that this, for the president, vice president, that, uh, that, that the this, this legislatures control all of that. It's called the Time, Place, and Manner Clause, and there's a substantial body of, of law surrounding that clause, and it's worth your taking a look at. So that, that finishes up our prior discussion. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for, for having me here. Uh, I have a sign in my office that I'm as anxious of, as you are for me to begin talking because I'm as curious as you are as to what I'm going to say. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's, that's true. Uh, and also to Judge Maureen Lally, Lally Green, Mar Maureen Skirta, where, where's Judge Skirta? There she is. Uh, Greg, you are correct. Uh, I, I go nowhere and I do nothing. But I, couldn't, I told you when I came up and visited the Jackson Center, you'd said you'll have to come back for a speech one day, and I fully said, sure, and then Judge Skirta called. So uh, she epitomizes, and there's let there be no doubt about this, there's, she epitomizes all that a judge should be, all that a human being should be. She's a dear friend. I hold her in great esteem, and it's largely because she asked that, that I came today. But I am very glad to be here. Incidentally, I figured out Warren County. It, I'm sorry, the city of Warren. It would not be here except when it was founded, traffic was by the river. And nobody had to get here on horseback or by car. Because <laughs> you can't get here from Pittsburgh. I've been on roads that no human being has seen for 100 years, <laughs> following my GPS up here. Uh, for a while, I wondered whether or not the roads were closed, given the lack of any traffic, lack of any uh, tire tracks or, or the like. Um, I'm wonder, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, when I was first asked, and it was Greg, and he asked me by cell phone, uh, I respectfully declined, notwithstanding my desire to uh, 
I say yes to Judge Skirta. And I designed it, I, I, I declined because this is a celebration of Robert Jackson's birthday. And I told Greg that I don't know enough about Justice Jackson to be able to speak on the topic for five minutes, let alone whatever, uh, goodness knows how long this is going to go. Somebody will have to cut me off. Um, uh, and so I, I just couldn't do it. And I said to him, I could speak on William Penn. I know something of him, and it's an interesting story. And I could speak on John Marshall. I know something of him. And I have before done that and tied the two together, although not as elaborately as we're going to tonight. And I said, but that leaves Justice Jackson out, and that's the point of this whole thing. And then between us, a light bulb went off. And I said, I'll tell you what I could do, Greg. I could call my friend, Greg's friend, many of your friends, John Barrett, uh, who is the world's leading expert in, in Justice Jackson and knows everything about Justice Jackson. And I could ask him if there's any tie-ins that I'm not aware of that, that would allow this to be meaningful at all. And I said, to the extent that he would be able to help, because his schedule is enormously busy, uh, and, and, and could suggest something, then perhaps I could do this. And I called, I called John. He was extraordinarily gracious and uh, just wonderful, as always. And, uh, and, and he helped. So to the extent I make errors tonight, they are all my own. I am not a history, history professor. I am not a scholar. I am a very good lawyer and a very good judge. Um, but you delve now into something that's not in my bailiwick, which is history. Uh, to the extent, however, you learn something about Justice Jackson, it is solely because of, Greg, because, because of John Barrett. So I thank him. Uh, I thank him profusely. Uh, he was a great help. And I, and I also echo, if you're not a member of the Jackson List, do it. Because John is not just a world-class scholar but he is a wonderful writer and just has the ability to make the words come alive. So I, 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 uh, I commend that to you. Now, I have no idea where I am in my notes already, so, but we'll keep going. Um, there's a fabric that ties English common law, which has been developing since before the 1500s, uh, to American law, and it's fascinating. And the fabric, there's a fabric that ties the three figures we're going to talk about today, William Penn, uh, John Marshall, Robert Jackson, together, yet they lived about 350 years apart. They had remarkably similar values, similar attributes. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. So I thought we would talk about the trail that leads from England to the United States with these three legendary giants being the, the focus uh, of what we're going to do. Uh, and we'll do that through, the, through two cataclysmic events in the law. The first involves the trial of William Penn and William Mead, who was his co-defendant. Uh, and the second is John Marshall's monumental decision in Marbury versus Madison, which I trust you've all heard of. Uh, and which we'll talk about. So let's begin in, in common law England. Now today, we all know that jury trials, which have been developing for better than a thousand years, and have been changing, and they continue to change. My court enters decisions all the time that, that will change something regarding the double jeopardy clause, the right to counsel, the waiver, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, but the jury trial, the jury is one of the most significant features. And every first grader knows that you're entitled to a fair and impartial jury, right? Comes from the Sixth Amendment. And I, incidentally, never go anywhere without my Constitution. This is not the copy that I always use. The copy that I always use, Justice Sotomayor was nice enough to sign for me when she was at Duquesne. And so I've been trying to preserve it. But I can't preserve it. I need it. I can't read one that's not my own. But I brought a different copy here. <coughs> so the Sixth Amendment says, in in all criminal procedures, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state. All of those mean something. Speedy trial, lots of law on that. Uh, a public trial, lots of law on can you close or not close courtrooms and what's the criteria. Uh, and by an impartial jury. Well, again, free and impartial jury. That, that sounds self-evident. It was not always so. So the seminal case 
that established that was no, uh, not under the, the trial of William Penn. Now, before retelling that, let me just note that the great William Penn, uh, and he was a great, great man, and the great Robert Jackson were actually related. Now, we've already heard about the Jackson family in Spring Hill, which I had in my notes, and I appreciate Greg doing that. But go back further. In 1742, which is 100 years after the birth of William Penn, I think 98, Diana Jarvis is born in Middlesex, England. She marries Dod Dodson Eldridge, hence the name Eldridge. They go on and they go on until eventually it's George that moves to um, uh, Spring Hill. And then George has Mary and Elijah, and we just heard, and we come down to Justice Jackson. So Diana Eldridge is Robert X. Jackson's, I think, and I got lost. Math is not my forte either. Uh, great, 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 great grandmother. Five generations, I think. If somebody uh, is math and wants to figure that out, perhaps it's six. I, but I think it's five. So what's the connection to William Penn? Interesting, because there may well be genetics at play in the greatness of the two. Uh, the Jackson family, and we have a member of the Jackson family here, so you have to go home and look at the family Bibles. The Jackson family contends that Diana Jarvis was the eighth removed great-grandmother of William Penn. She was, uh, I'm sorry, Robert Jackson, was the granddaughter of William Penn that Diana Jackson is the grandmother of William Penn, no, I'm sorry, granddaughter of William Penn, and also the relationship to Jackson's. Now, that's not proven. She may have been a niece, she may have been a cousin. That's lost somewhat in history. But in any event, they, were, they are related, Jackson and Penn. Uh, they do share many attributes, which we're going to talk about. And you trace it back to 1742 and uh, Diana Jarvis which I thought was interesting. And again, you can bring it all forward, but I don't have to do that, which I appreciate. Um, it's Grace Church Street, London, England. It's 1670, a fur piece ago. William Penn and William Mead, good friends, are preaching the Quaker faith to a crowd of between 300 and 500 on Grace Street. Now, at this point, Penn is 25 years old. He's a lawyer, got his law degree by reading law at the Lincoln's Inn, for those of you that know, Inns of Courts in London. By all accounts, he is brilliant. He's very serious. He never yields on a point. Uh, I, I think that if you were a detractor, you would say that he is obnoxiously obstinate, as we shall see. And he's dedicated to the principles of uh, his religion, Quakerism. It teaches equality among all people. And in fact, Quaker ceremonies, at least at that point, uh, generally did not have a religious leader. Generally, they were a gathering and there were periods of self-reflection. There may have been some speaking. But I mention that because it's very unlikely that at Gray Street, at this point in time, that anything was boisterous, that anything was dangerous, or in the words of the indictment, which I'm going to read to you in a second, that Penn and Meade were tumultuous, causing great terror and disturbance. So what was the problem? Without getting into the intricacies of yet another fascinating, complicated story, it was religious intolerance. King Charles II was very devoted to the Church of England. He did not want Quakerism being taught or spoken about. He did not want... Um, Puritanism, which I think plays a part in our story, although that's my personal theory, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the constables on patrol, the cops, arrest Penn and Meade. Uh, now, Penn was already well known to the Crown and to the prosecutors. Uh, as I already said, he had unyielding principles and fierce advocacy. So at 25, he had already done eight months in the Tower of London for blasphemy. What he had actually done is preached his religion. And indeed, he was expelled from Oxford. 
Now, it was a great time back then. You couldn't get expelled from your college and still get, read for the law in today's world. The bar, we would not admit you, but he could. He was expelled from Oxford, what for? For holding Quaker ceremonies in his room and boycotting the mandatory uh, sessions at the chapel where they taught Church of England. So he's 25, and you can already see that this is not going to be an easy trial for those of you who remember the Chicago 7 or the like. So we're at Old Bailey, which to this day is the criminal courthouse uh, in London. And the trial is about to begin. So uh, the indictment is read, and I'm going to abbreviate it because it's too long, but still worth reading. That William Penn and William Mead unlawfully and too much illicitly, that word, did assemble and congregate themselves together to the disturbance of the peace of the said Lord the King. I'm sure that, that uh, William Penn just loved the said Lord the King. And the aforesaid William Penn did take it upon himself to preach and speak in contempt of the said Lord the King and of his law to the great disturbance of his peace, to the great terror and disturbance of many of his liege people and subjects, to the of all others in the like case offenders and against the peace of said Lord the King, his crown and his dignity. You, for those of you who have been prosecutors in your life, do you think perhaps they were overcharged? Won't be the first or the last time. Case goes to trial before 10 jurors, I'm sorry, 12 jurors, 12 jurors, and 10 judges. Different process than we have. The fact that there are 10 judges uh, indicates that this case was important to the crown. Uh, and that it wanted it to go well. But it does not start out well, as you might expect. Penn and Mead enter the courtroom. Quakers had the habit of wearing a uh, little hat, as do Catholic clergy, as do Orthodox Jews. They wore a little hat to show respect. But Penn and Mead had lost their hat between Grace Street, uh, the jail, and the courtroom. So immediately, one of the judges stops them and says, where are your hats? And they said, well, we lost them. We're sorry. And he says to the bailiff, provide them with new hats. Put them on their heads. And so the bailiff does. Then he says, take your hats off and out of respect to the court. <laughs> they refused. Quakers did not remove their hats for superiors, consistent with their belief in the quality of all men. Uh, and so they said, no, we will not. Immediately, they were found in contempt meeting in, in, in Penn, and they were fined for refusal to remove their hats. Now, there's a quick contemporary tie-in to this story that's worth mentioning. And again, I thank Professor Barrett, who told me everything about Justice Jackson, which includes this. Uh, the tradition in the United States Supreme Court in the 40s, when Justice Jackson stood there, and today, is they announced their decisions from the bench. We do not. We, I don't know how we file them. It's not my department. But somehow they get from my secretary to our filing clerk and, 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 and to the pathonetary where they're docketed. And I never know when a case is filed unless I read it in the newspaper because I'm just working on the next case. I'm not worried about the prior case. But they read theirs from the bench. They still do today, as I said. The majority author will read it, and the dissenting author will read the dissent. For those of you who have seen uh, RBG about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she wears various collars, and she has special collars for dissents and special collars when she's especially angry in her dissent, which, which I got a kick out of. Um, Justice Jackson's preparing to issue from the bench his majority opinion in West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett. Now, this case held the Jehovah Witnesses children could not be forced to engage in symbolic speech against their rights to free speech. They, were not for, they could not be forced to salute. They were not forced to pledge allegiance to the flag or salute the flag. In typical Jackson fashion, and in really a remarkable mimicry to the way William Penn was, as we will continue to see, the opinion is a masterful defense of freedom of speech. So as he's preparing to announce uh, his opinion. It was his practice to take the slip opinion. Everybody know what a slip opinion is? It's the opinion just printed on some loose pages before it's eventually uh, published and 
officially docketed. So he takes his slip opinion and he marks on it what he wants to say. And interestingly, Justice Jackson marked his pauses, his words of emphasis. And so, uh, and he crosses out something. You don't read your whole opinion because these opinions can be 20 or 30 pages and you want to do this in five minutes from the bench. Uh, he gets to the part of his opinion where he wants to say that an individual has a right not to be coerced into symbolic speech, not to salute, to bow, to bend the knee, or to bear a head, in the words of Justice Jackson. And I think unusually, on the top right of the slip opinion, he writes in hand, quote, William Penn's refusal to remove his hat in the presence of the king, end quote. Now, again, that's it, that, and there's no record because at that point they did not record Supreme Court proceedings. Today we do. But I have every reason to believe, and Professor Barrett uh, has every reason to believe, that he used that. And he extemporaneously provided that example of how this great man from Britain and in the United States uh, was invoking the same religious freedom and freedom of speech that he was calling for for the Jehovah Witness children. Uh, connecting, again, the two of them 350 years away from each other, with same ideals, same beliefs. So let's return to our trial. And again, I can see Justice Jackson and William Penn trading places, but for where they are in history. As you may suspect, things are not about to calm down. Lord Reed principally spoke for the court, for the ten judges. During early testimony, he, the, the, the police officer made the arrest, uh, says that he saw Penn preaching on Gray Street, but he never saw Meade. So Lord Reed immediately turns to Meade and he says, what say you, Mr. Meade, were you there? Meade, evidently pretty shrewd himself, it, it is a maxim of your own law. No man is bound to accuse himself. Why dost thou offer to ensnare me with such a question? So again, who knows what that is? The right against self-incrimination, right? Whoop, I'm back in the, the jurisdiction section. Fifth Amendment. No person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. That's what Meade is invoking in 1670 in common law England. Evidently, he had a good crim pro professor. Uh, the judge's response was, hold your tongue. I did not go about to ensnare you. The case continues in the same vein. The judges keep trying to ask questions. Penn keeps shouting. Uh, and finally, this exchange takes place. And it's very fortunate that we have this. Penn, or the judge, how plead you? Penn, we confess that we worship God, which is our indispensable duty. Not all powers of the earth shall be able to divert us from referencing and adoring our God who made us. Judge Reed, you are not here for worshiping God, but for breaking the law. You do yourselves a great deal of wrong in going on this discourse. Penn, I affirm. Note he does not swear. He affirms. Carried on to this day. I have broken no law. I am guilty of the indictment. I am, nor am I guilty of the indictment that is laid on this charge. To this end, the bench, the jury, and myself, with those that hear us, may have a more direct understanding of this procedure. I desire you would let me know at what law it is that you prosecute me, and under what law you ground my indictment. The court. Under the common law, Penn, where is this common law? The court, you must not think that I am able to run up so many years and over so many judge cases, which we call common law, to answer your curiosity. Penn, the answer I am sure is very short of my question, for if it be common, it should be not so hard to produce. Lord Reed, sir, will you plead to the indictment? I'll talk about this in a second, but if you really listen to this, they have two different agendas going on. Reed wants to try this case. Penn wants to put the system on trial. 
and he wants to change the issue. And he who can successfully set forth the issue will always win the argument. And that's what Penn's trying to do. Penn, shall I plead to an indictment that has no foundation in the law? If it contained that law you say I've broken, why should you decline to produce that law? Since it will be impossible for the jury, playing to the jury, since it will be impossible for the jury to determine or agree to bring in their verdict, who have not the law produced, I rest my case. Judge, you are a saucy fellow. Speak to the indictment. You see the parallel tracks on going here? Uh, Penn, and again, I would say Penn is playing the judge, and the judge is being played beautifully. I, Penn, I say, it is not my place to speak to a matter of law. I am arraigned a prisoner. My liberty, which is next to life itself, is now concerned. You are many mouths and ears against me, and if I must not be allowed to make the best of my case, it is hard. I say again, unless you show me the, peop me, the people, the jury, the law you ground your indictment upon, I shall take it for granted that your proceedings are arbitrary. Lord Reed, the question is whether you are guilty of the indictment. Penn, the question is not whether I'm guilty of the indictment. It's whether the indictment is legal. Very clever. But the indictment is legal. The judge, you are an impertinent. He's gone from saucy now to impertinent. You're an impertinent fellow. Will you teach this court what the law is? Again, missing the point. Penn, certainly, if the common law be so hard to be understood, it's far from being very common. The judge, sir, you are a troublesome fellow. The adjectives keep getting worse. And it's not for the honor of this court to suffer you to go on. Penn, I have asked but one question. You have not answered it. The rights and privileges of every Englishman should be concerned with it. Brilliant tactical move. He's looking at the jury and he's saying, this isn't about me. It's not about me. It's about you, good Englishmen, who don't know, or don't, can be charged without knowing what the law is. Lord Reed, if I should suffer you to ask questions until tomorrow morning, you would never be the wiser. It's true. Penn, that's according as the answers may be. Judge, he's had enough. Take this persistent fellow out. Stop his mouth. We shall not be able to do anything tonight. Take him away. Take him away. Turn him into the bail dock. Penn is taken out of his seat. The bail dock is a cage. It's below ground level in the courtroom where Penn can be heard, but the jury can't see him and he can't see them. Implicates uh, your rights of confrontation, and I won't read you the constitutional provision unless you have a real interest, uh, but you have a right to confront the witnesses against you. Again, there's a substantial body of law about that. If you have a defendant who just will not cooperate, can they be bound and put in another room and watch the proceedings on closed circuit. The United States Supreme Court said yes, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said no. That caused an amendment to the Pennsylvania Constitution, which was passed. So now in Pennsylvania, they, you can uh, have a defendant watch on closed circuit television without violating his state constitutional right, which is more draconian than the federal constitutional right, the confrontation. He could hear the proceedings. He could continue to yell and shout, which he did, but he couldn't see anything. Finally, after great travail, with Meade and Penn from his cage scrouting, the case goes to the jury, which is really the point of all of this. But I, I thought it worthwhile to give you a feel, both of William Penn and uh, of Robert Jackson, uh, as in the vigor and the uh, righteousness with which they defend their positions. Um, the judge explicitly, without equivocation, instructs the jury to convict the defendants. Now, that was permissible at this time in common law England. It was customary. Again, it's a Sixth Amendment violation, right? We've already read that. Fair and impartial jury. How do you have a fair and impartial jury if the, the Crown gets to tell you what the verdict's going to be? But it did, and that was the way they did things. The jury elect deliberates. They elect one Edward Bouchel, and Bouchel is one of the great heroes of our story, to be their foreman. They return to the courtroom with the verdict. And the transcript reads like this. Court clerk, are you agreed upon your verdict? Jury, yes. Court clerk, who shall speak for you? Jury, our foreman, Mr. Bushell. Clerk, 
Look upon the prisoners at the bar. How say you? Is William Penn and William Meade, but we're concentrating on Penn. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, guilty of the matter whereof they stand indicted. Bouchel. They are guilty of speaking on Grace Church Street. The court says, is that all? Bouchel, that is all. You have, you, court, you have as good as said nothing. Lord Reed, it is not a, it, it, was it not an unlawful assembly? You mean he was speaking to a tumult of people there? Bushell, my Lord, that was all I have in commission. That is our verdict. Lord Reed, the law of England will not allow you to depart till you have given your verdict. Bushell, we have given our verdict, and we cannot give any other. Reed, gentlemen, you have not given your verdict, and you had as good have said nothing. Therefore, go and consider it once more that we may make an end of this troublesome business. Bouchel, we desire to have pen, ink, and paper. Uh, I'm going to do this more gently next time, I think. From the bail dock, William Penn is yelling, and he yells, Ye are Englishmen, give not away your right, which has been his design the whole time. And tellingly, someone on the jury responds, nor will we ever do it. Lord Reed's in trouble, isn't he? The court adjourns for about a half hour, 45 minutes, it comes back. Clerk, are you agreed on your verdict? The jury, yes. Who shall speak for you? Bushell, what say you? Look upon the prisoners, guilty or not guilty. Bushell, here's our verdict, and he hands him a piece of paper with writing on it. And the writing reads as follows. We, the jurors, find William Penn to be guilty of speaking or preaching to an assembly met together on Grace Church Street. We find Mr. Meade not guilty of the said indictment. Read, gentlemen, you shall not be dismissed till we have a verdict the court will accept, and you shall be locked up without meat, drink, fire, and tobacco. You shall not think thus to abuse the court. We will have a verdict by help of God, or you shall starve for it. The jury spends the night in Newgate Prison. For those of you who have been to London, Newgate is beside Old Bailey. It is not a nice place. Uh, and they, the jury spends the night there. They come back. For the third time, they deliver the same verdict. The court considers it uh, improper, admonishes them. We know the story now. Sends them out for a fourth time. Now they break the impasse. This is actually clever. They come back and they say, we find William Penn not guilty. <laughs> that is a final verdict. That was always their option, guilty or not guilty. Anybody know what jury nullification is? Yeah, yeah. Jury nullification is the jury's right to recognize that somebody is guilty and find them not guilty anyway. All right, O.J. Simpson? I don't know that that jury really thought he didn't do it. Robert Kravakian, he had all sorts of writings that what he was doing was, um, uh, was assisted suicide. He admitted to it. He talked about it. He's probably on YouTube about it. Jury came back and said not guilty because it didn't object to the practice, and that's their right. I think this jury just engaged in some ju ju jury nullification, which is, was the right then is the right now. So they come back and they say not guilty. Well, the judge doesn't like that. But he does have a verdict. So what's he do? He says to the jurors, you're all in contempt of my court, my directions. Uh, and, and I'm fining you each. And you can stay in Newgate prison until you pay your fines. And then for good measure, Lord Reed says, and Penn and Meade, I'm jailing you until you pay your fines for refusing to remove your hats. And so they all go to Newgate together. Now, eight of the 12 jurors have had enough. They pay their fines and they go home. But not Edward Bushell. Uh, do you remember that I mentioned that the Church of England was supreme over Quakerism and Puritanism? Well, it turns out that Ed Bushell's a Puritan. And there may have been some identification between him and William Penn. He was also extraordinarily wealthy. He owned a big shipping business. 
He could have well afforded to bail them all out. He had lawyers. But he did the third thing, first being defiance of the Crown's demand of a jury, the second being jury nullification, in my mind, sort of my two cents on this thing. He filed a writ of habeas corpus. Everybody know what a writ of habeas corpus is? That literally means that uh, you have the body. It is the calm. There are nine great writs, most of them unknown today. But the writ of habeas corpus remains very known. If somebody is unlawfully detained, the way she or he brings that to the court's attention is they file a writ of habeas corpus. And it will be heard. And if they're unlawfully de detained, they will be released. And again, my court gets them on some occasion where a trial court judge gets testy and throws somebody in jail like William Penn, who's just plain obnoxious. But that's not a crime. And so um, it could be contempt, but that's a different subject. And then we'll get a writ of habeas corpus if the superior court will. And a lot of times we'll act on it. I say, come on, let the guy out of jail. He's not a criminal. Um, but in any event, Ed Bouchel files one. Lord Reed says no on some arcane jurisdictional grounds, which I have not studied. Um, after nine weeks, England's high court gets involved. And Chief Justice John Vaughan founds that the habeas has merit and releases Bouchel and the other three jurors. Um, importantly, in fact, more importantly, Chief Justice Vaughan establishes the first time that the jury had a right to enter that verdict without being found in contempt. And he opined, why should a juror be in prison for abiding by his own oath and integrity? To say that a jury acquitted contrary to the instructions of the court in a matter of law is not intelligible. We must take off this veil and color of words. What use would a jury be otherwise? The judge's direction should be hypothetical and not positive. If you find the facts thus, then you are to find for the plaintiff. If you find the facts thus, then you are to find to the defendant. The trial of William Penn established for the first time in the development of the jury trial, common law, American law, the right to a fair, impartial jury to decide a case in according to what they believe to be correct even to engage in jury nullification, which we don't know if they did. Maybe they thought he was not guilty, but I don't think so. Um, I think they were upholding the rights of Englishmen, and we know what a proud people the English are. And I think they were identifying with William Penn and not identifying with Lord Reed. So the writ of habeas corpus now becomes born and becomes viable for someone who is uh, improperly defined. Now, I mentioned all of this occurred at uh, the London Criminal Courthouse, Old Bailey. Well, the first Old Bailey was built in 1585 on Old Bailey Street, perhaps not surprising. Uh, if you visit it today, there is a, and I had the chance to do this, and I'm going to have another chance, I'm going back this, this summer. Uh, there's a plaque to William Penn and William Mead, and it remembers and it celebrates Ed Bouchel and the other brave jurors who stood their ground, established for all of us the right to a free and independent jury. And again, I might say that Robert Jackson, in different circumstances, took the same type of heroic actions. When he was named the chief prosecutor at Nuremberg, he demanded, he demanded that these really horrible Nazi criminals, war criminals, horrible war, war criminals, be given full due process rights and be given full trials. And, and that was done. And he didn't, it didn't have that much to do with them. It had to do with his sense of what's right, what's just, as it was for William Penn. Uh, and on multiple occasions at the US Supreme Court, he wrote eloquently to protect the rights of the dispossessed, the rights of the unpopular, the rights of the minority, as the Jehovah Witness children. I'm sure that was not a popular decision in 1943. It was a courageous decision. All right, let's forward with, with that in mind 10 quick years. Penn is still driving the crown and the establishment insane. His father, who was a great man, Admiral William Penn, uh, has passed away. He was a member of the House of Commons. He was a commander of ships at sea during uh, wars for, for Britain. He was friends of the king. The king owes Admiral Penn and I figured it out in today's world, about $4.5 million. 
So he gives William Penn Pennsylvania and actually Delaware in satisfaction of the debt. And Penn takes it and sails for the New World. This is 1680. In 1684, he starts the Provincial Court of Pennsylvania, which is colloquially called the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. It's not independent. It's a provincial court that answers to the crown. Uh, it does have the right to fair juries. Now we know why. And it has other rights. Um, it doesn't do much. Uh, and the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't do much either because courts were not very important back then. There was no concept of judicial review or unconstitutional or the like. Notwithstanding, the colonists of Pennsylvania wanted an independent court. So in 1722, a deal is struck. Politics has never changed. The provincial governor wanted more tax dollars. The provincial legislature wanted an independent judiciary. Voila. A deal is struck. The Judicial Act of 1722 is passed. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, with that name, is born. Uh, and and uh, it was led by many illustrious lawyers at that time. And I only mention a couple uh, because you know them. Uh, the first Chief Justice was Thomas McCain, McCain County. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. The second was Isaac Norris, who picked out the passage from Leviticus that's on the Liberty Bell. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land until all the inhabitants thereof. Ben Franklin did not sit on the Supreme Court, but did sit as a judge in Philadelphia. Uh, and, and many mothers did. Now remember at this point, Philadelphia is it. There's nothing at Pittsburgh. There's not even a fort, Fort Duquesne, Fort Pitt. The first fort is 1754, I believe. I didn't have a chance to look that up, but I think that's correct. There's also no Harrisburg. Harrisburg was laid out in 1785, and we're talking 1722. So it's Philadelphia, and that's it. So from 1722 to 1776 to 1789, when the Constitution's written, it's all about Philadelphia. Great judges sitting on the court, great, great lawyers practicing before. And when our founding fathers are finally in 1787 drafting our Constitution of 1789, it's fair to say they're looking at the Pennsylvania Supreme Court as a model, and they're friends with those people, probably having mead each evening uh, at a local tavern with them and, and, and talking to them on how the Pennsylvania Supreme Court works as they fashion the U.S. Supreme Court. That's my own surmisal. I think it's reasonable. I think it's a fair inference. Uh, again, none of this matters a great deal, as I just alluded to. Uh, the courts didn't do much. So the U.S. Supreme Court first term began February 1790, with some pomp, I think. Never heard a case. Nobody came to them with a darn thing to decide. Eighteen months later, in August 1791, they got their first case. Just see them. Oh, boy. It's a debt dispute between two people. They heard argument on day one, and they decided it on day two. And that was it for their second term. Uh, and then something changes, which is the point of all of this. The Supreme Court first theoretically and then pragmatically becomes extraordinarily important, leading to the Supreme Court we know today, where we all hold our breath when decisions are, are being made and count votes and speculate endlessly. Uh, what happens? It's 1796. Constitution is 15 years old. Uh, the federal judicial system is beginning to develop. John Adams is president. His secretary of state is none other than John Marshall, soon to be the chief justice of the United States. They are federalists. Federalists believe in expansive government. They believe government can help people, can save lives. They therefore have an expansive role of the constitutional interpretation and statutory interpretation consistent therewith. In 1800, uh, Thomas Jefferson, well, in 17, the election of 1799, Thomas Jefferson defeats John Adams. Jefferson is a Democrat-Republican, which was the opposition party of the day. 
We'll just call it Republican. It's just easier. Could call it Democrat, although the philosophies are somewhat more consistent with the Republican Party of today. They believe in smaller government. They believe in states' rights. They believe in a strict construction of the Constitution uh, and the new laws. While well, the Federalists, after this election, are beside themselves. In addition to losing the presidency, they lost the House of Representatives, and they barely hung on to the Senate. Indeed, they lost the Senate, I believe, two years later. But they hung on to the Senate. So under our system, which hasn't changed, uh, who nominates federal judges? The president. Who confirms? The Senate. Uh, so in the last days of Adams' presidency, and remember, John Marshall is the Secretary of State, they nominate the midnight judges. I don't know if anybody's heard that term. Famous, famous term, the midnight judges. They were all Federalists. They packed the bench. As a harbingers to today, Mitch McConnell, and our president, uh, very interested in changing the federal judiciary, which is their right. Um, but in any event, they pack the bench. Marshall becomes Chief Justice. Marshall and, Tho and Thomas Jefferson are cousins, but they're fierce political rivals. Remember that Marshall is a uh, very fierce Federalist and Jefferson a very f fierce Democrat Republican. They at least intensely disliked each other, if not outright hated each other. So Jefferson walks into his office, new president, well aware of the midnight judges, and he finds there uh, a group of commissions. Now, again, a commission is how a secretary of state, including the secretary of state of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, certifies to the official swearing in a judge that the judge has been duly elected or appointed. You have to have your commission before you get sworn in. It's one of the reasons that we have an election in November and swear in in January. It takes that long to get a commission. He finds a bunch of commissions. Now, if he was the saint that we wanted him to be, what would he would do? He would send all those commissions out. Never saw them again. All of those Adams Marshall commissions disappear. Obviously, they're not happy. So the judges are disgruntled, and they don't have the ability to become judges. But one of them, Mr. Marbury, doesn't want to take it lying down. He wants his commission. He wants to be a judge. So he brings a writ of mandamus, another one of the great writs. Quick travel through, through law school for all of you. And, and mandamus is used every day today. Mandamus is a writ that says that a government official must perform a ministerial act, an act that he has no discretion. And the argument is uh, to um, James Madison, who's now Secretary of State, taking John Morrill's place, uh, there's nothing more for you to do. The president nominated these judges. The Senate confirmed them. You must take the act of um, delivering the commissions so that Mr. Marbury can be sworn in. Now, Chief Justice Marshall's in a really tough spot. Let me digress one more time. Justice Jackson has written to this, and he he's, was interested, very interested, in the question of the uh, judiciary and the Supreme Court in particular recusing when they had an interest. So in July 2043, he wrote a letter to Irving Dillard, who was the a writer at that point at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, became editor and is a very famous constitutional and Supreme Court scholar. And he, argue, he made the argument that Madison, the Secretary of the State, was, or quote, carelessly left, end of quote, the commissions on some desk. And therefore, he's involved, has some culpability for Marbury not getting his commission and not being sworn in. And he, and he should have recused, recused himself. Interestingly, again, and Jackson was a very righteous man, as was Penn. Perhaps Marshall was more pragmatic at this point in history. He did not recuse himself, and that was fortunate for the new United States. Uh, he uh, decided the case. And again, I said he's in a tough spot. If he decides his case for Jefferson, he knows that's wrong. And he has ethics and doesn't want to do it wrong. 
If he decides it for Marbury, he's convinced that Jefferson will ignore him. He has no army. He has no taxing power. The judicial branch isn't even important. They said uh, at one point in time, Jefferson said, go home, and they missed the term, ironically. Can you hear, see that today? Trump says, go home, and the Supreme Court doesn't hear cases for, for a term. Well, that actually happened back then. So he's in a difficult spot. He writes a 100-page opinion, more than 100 pages, if memory serves me. And he excoriates uh, Jefferson in every possible way. He says, this is the most horrible thing he's ever seen, and it's not just, and it's not law, and how dare he? And he says, Madison, or he says, Marbury, you're absolutely entitled to your commission. And then he says, but Mr. Marbury, I apologize, but we can't help you. Now, this is a trick worthy of Houdini. Uh, and it got him out of that spot. He opens his new constitution to Article 3, which is the judicial article, Section 2, Clause 2. And he puts it in the opinion. And it says to the second, in all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and councils, in those cases in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction. He says, Mr. Marbury, I know you sued under the Judicial Act of 1789. I know that gave us original jurisdiction, but it's unconstitutional. It's inconsistent with what I just read. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, uh, we're throwing your case out. Brilliant. Brilliant. He's not in a power struggle with Jefferson, and yet he wrote an opinion where he said, I know who should win here, and I know why he should win. Uh, really crucial, I think. And what he established there, it's not obvious, is the right of judicial review. The right of the U.S. Supreme Court to say this is unconstitutional, regardless of what the question is. So let, and let me read you his words. And I think we're about done here. I hope this has been an interesting journey. Justice, uh, Chief Justice Marshall said, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Those who apply the rule to a particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. If two laws conflict with each other, the court must decide on the operation of each. Now that's a nuclear bomb. Instead of deciding debt cases, property cases, criminal cases, the Supreme Court is beginning to scrutinize everything for constitutionality. State courts now have state constitution, and we do also. And that's the reason that today, uh, Supreme, the, the U.S. Supreme Court is so very important, and appropriately so, to our society because of its judicial review requirement as established by John Marshall. So let me jump 150 years or so, 1947, to Justice Jackson. He's standing in the shadow of Justice Marshall which today, for those of you who have been there, is in the great hall of the Supreme Court as you enter the courtroom. But back then, uh, was on the uh, west side of the main Capitol building. The Supreme Court courtroom originally was in the basement of the main Capitol building. I love that courtroom. I'm not sure other people do. It looks like a little dungeon, but I like its intimacy. Um, in any event, he's standing in the shadow of Justice Jackson, and he's giving a speech on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the country of Liberia, which is an African nation that was established for American slaves who didn't want to stay in the United States to have a, a homeland on the African soil. And he, write, he delivers these words. But if our constitutional system of liberty does at time afford an inadequate and imperfect protection to the individual and the minority, it cannot be denied that it comes near to that goal than any other. It differentiates us, differentiates us sharply and favorably from those systems which are founded in the philosophy that all individual rights are submerged in the will of the state and that no minority has the right to oppose the government. The dignity of the individual 
the right of the people to be governed by a system of administration of their choice, the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is the confession of political faith in which the people of both our countries, Liberia and the United States, put their trust. The road to the truly ideal society is uphill and stretches beyond our sight, but we will travel it together. And I would suggest that in addition to traveling it forward, as Justice Jackson suggests, we can also travel it backward as we've seen today, whether it's to Marbury versus Madison, to the Crown versus William Penn, Penn and so many other times. When fine people stand up for the dispossessed, for the minority, for what is right, as William Penn did to his great inconvenience. I'm sure he did not enjoy those eight months in the Tower of London, but it was the right thing to do. And Justice Jackson did at Nuremberg and at the US Supreme Court. Uh, and as John Marshall did when he took on the executive branch and the legislative branch and said, no, this is the judiciary's rule. So these three form this unbreakable chain. Greg, I don't know if I've tied them together, but I have tried. Uh, let, me, let me finish with this. I sit on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Uh, my dear friend, Chief Justice Tom Saylor, is a year older than I am. So I will be the Chief Justice in 1722. And for those of you who've been listening, what's 1722? What's the consequence? It's the 300th anniversary of the Judicial Act of 1722. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court is the oldest operating appellate court in the, United, in, in the Western Hemisphere. And it's probably the oldest court in the Western Hemisphere, although there's a trial court in Boston that wants to contest that honor. And I confess I don't have time to figure that out. But uh, it's certainly among the very oldest. We have never missed a term, unlike the US Supreme Court. Uh, we have served continuously. Uh, and um, uh, we're going to celebrate that anniversary. So I would invite all of you. I would invite the Jackson Center, uh, which has such a close tie to Warren County and Spring Hill, um, to think about that and to perhaps join with the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, in celebration of the really momentous accomplishment of 300 years of, of, of true action and many, many extraordinarily significant decisions. Let me again thank Professor John Barrett. Uh, without him, I could not have done this, as I hope is apparent. I thank Greg, thank Maureen, and thank all of you for bearing with me. Uh, and, and again, Greg, I don't know protocol, I'm happy to answer questions about anything. And if I don't have any idea, I will certainly tell you so. Uh, and if I have some idea from somewhere in my mind to do that. And if not, I'm certainly ready to get on to the partying. Thank you all so much. Any questions for uh, Justice Baird before we Call it an evening. Josh, do you have that one for the, do you need that final quote for the article? Okay. Uh, Allegheny College, anything? You can, he'll be here. Justice Baer will be here afterwards, and I've got a concluding remark here, if I could. As uh, Justice Baer said, and gave uh, due uh, respect to John Barrett, and John, I'll, I'll paraphrase here a little bit, his blog on, called Birthday, Robert Jackson's 219 birthday will be celebrated with official events, including in the schools and in the courthouse in Warren, Pennsylvania, the seat of Warren County. I hope, says John Barrett, that it will be celebrated in woods and small towns, in quiet reading spots with writing instruments, in well-crafted phrases, by eloquent voices, making powerful arguments with deep respect for law by lawyers and judges. And we just heard this from Justice Max Baer. Thank you very much. Appreciate it ever so much. And I draw your attention as we draw closure. Uh, there's some uh, terrific sponsors who made this entire event possible. Please take a look at the program, and it will identify those who really made it possible. And again, to Judge Skirta, uh, thank you so much for making this courthouse available, because uh, it is historic. This is an historic day. 
given by an historic person and an historic speech. So I thank you very much, Judge Barrett. Thank you. We stand adjourned. Chief Justice. I wouldn't say yes or no. Thank you for that. God bless you. Thank you. In my regards, Justice. Oh, I will, absolutely.